let, let's start. So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this, um, let's call it today, the NITEX colloquium. As, as you all know, we are in the process of transforming NITEP into NITEX. And um, I think we, everybody needs slowly to get used to the new, to the new name. Of the, of the new Institute for Theoretical and, and Computational Sciences. And um, we don't have yet a logo, but hopefully we will have one very soon. Yeah. So this afternoon, um, we are very happy to have Professor Nico Orce <coughs> uh, with us. <coughs> Nico is based at the University of the Western Cape. And as you can guess from the title of this talk, he's a nuclear physicist. Yeah? So <coughs> uh, Nico uh, is, is involved in, uh, in many uh, research collaborations at many of the big laboratories in the all uh, over the, the world. And for instance, he's working in the Mandela B collaboration. He works at the Temba Labs. He's involved in SALT, MLL, where I have to confess, I don't know <laughs> exactly what it is. Yeah, in, in Triumph and of course uh, in, uh, in, in, in Sir, at CERN. Yeah? And um, he's been, uh, he's uh, and has been a leading uh, PI uh, of the GAMCA spectrometer. He's the chair of the TACE of nuclear physics. Uh, he's the referee for many prestigious uh, journals. <clears throat> and he's an honorary visiting professor at the University of, uh, of York. And over the years, uh, he's graduated many, many masters and, uh, and PhD students and, and raised lots of uh, research grants. Yeah? So Nico, we are, we are very uh, fortunate uh, and uh, sorry, and I have to mention, and, and, and Nico is, is, is already an associate of, of NITEX. Yeah? So for those of you that uh, were or still are associates of NITEX, please um, make an effort to become associates of, uh, of NITEX. It's not very difficult. Yeah? Okay, Nico, uh, thank you very much for being with us this afternoon. And um, people are here to listen to your talk and, and, and not to me. <laughs> So while you, while you set up, uh, just a quick reminder to the audience to please make use of the Q&A facility uh, to ask questions. And um, between um, Ilya, uh, Professor Sinaiski, and myself, we, 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 will, we will make an effort to, to moderate the questions. <clears throat> OK, thank you very much, uh, Francesco. Uh, I enjoy very much giving talks because myself, I, I learn in the process. So uh, don't mind if I, if I give, <laughs> if I invite myself a couple of times. So uh, today, actually, I wanted to talk about how atomic nuclei polarize, which is our latest research. And we have, uh, as I mentioned in the, in, the, in the abstract, we have a, a very relevant paper which was published last, last year. And it was selected in World Scientific as a, one of the those long-standing uh, valuable papers but i i'm going to i just realized that once i was re reading the abstract uh, about the nuclear force remains el elusive uh, 110 years after the discovery of the nucleus i realized that i i started uh, from that basic from that fun fundamentals and i think it will be too long for me to to go through the, the shell effects in regarding re, related to, to nuclear polarizability, and uh, uh, I will go as much as I can. So this is, as I say, um, nuclear physics 110 years after the discovery of the of the nucleus. Everyone knows this picture of the alpha particles being collimated and deflected at backward angles, and no one knew why this happened. And actually, it was Rutherford uh, after the experiment was uh, was undertaken by mainly by Mars and Geiger uh, under his supervision. So these uh, these poor guys they almost get blind in the in the process of detecting the flash with their own eyes, you know. But there were some flashes here, as you can see, that they uh, they uh, the only way to explain it was by saying, okay, most of the beam gets deflected, all these alpha particles helium force to proton and to neutrons on this gold foil. So the only way for them to be deflected instead of having this plum cake of electrons is it was to have a, the atom, atomic nucleus in there. So uh, 
I'm taking most of the of the weight uh, of the atom, and so these uh, alpha particles could be deflected. So 110 years later, after that, we have explored the nuclear shard. This is our our landscape, and we have uh, developed different models and. This remains the, the, the cornerstone of nuclear physics, the, the shell model. And as you can see here, you have all these black squares. It looks like a, like a snake skin, but uh, uh, it is actually the, all the, the known nuclei, which are about 3,000 known nuclei, or 270 are stable, and the, and the remaining are unstable. And as you can see, the, depending on the nucleus, they decay by an alpha particle or the beta decay or beta plus or beta minus, depending on where you are. You are on this side, on the left side of the line of, of the value of stability, these black squares. Then you beta plus. If you are on the right side, you beta minus because you have a, a proton or a neutron uh, in excess. This, these guys here, the beta plus, will have a proton converted into a neutron plus a, a positron, plus a neutrino, and these beta minus guys will decay. Eventually, everyone wants to become stable, like ourselves in life. However, there are many more nuclei you know, that we don't know anything about. These are the, the dark green are what we know, and the light green is what we don't know. And these are produced in different uh, stellar uh, uh, explosions, right? And uh, there are different network paths, net network uh, production of these elements. You have the different, uh, you know, the RP process, the rapid proton capture, the rapid neutron capture, which is supposed to produce most of the, of the heavy elements above iron. And these predictions of the, of the, of the borders of the stability, of nuclear stability, are not very well known. And this, what is called the drip line, it depends basically on how many neutrons you can capture, a nucleus, a nucleus can, uh, can capture, while competing with the, the, the beta minus, which wants to bring it back to the line of uh, stability, these black squares in the middle, right? So recently, it was very exciting to see that uh, there's some indication that strontium has been uh, indirectly detected uh, in, in neutron star mergers. And this is a, a big discovery because the, the astrophysical side for this up-process nuclei or the, the creation of these elements wasn't, uh, wasn't entirely clear. Uh, it's beautiful to see that uh, there's some indications, not confirmed, I would say yet, that uh, heavy elements are produced in neutron star mergers. So it has to, it has to be. But uh, there's no uh, clear evidence, I would say, and that but that will take another another talk. So as I say, uh, there are about four thousand remain and no nuclei, and these uh, conform the the drip line, the 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 borders where where nuclear binding ends, right? And this is called the Terra Incognita. All these white spots here, there's nothing discovered, and these are the lines, the predicted lines or borders of uh, of the nuclear shard. And as you can see, there's large uncertainties. Uh, we don't really know whether they close up or they are up and down. We don't really know, actually. Um, yeah, I won't tell you more, but this one, we have uh, submitted a paper recently, but I will let you know when the, the time comes. So what is the problem here with the nuclear force? I was, I was wondering, OK, we, we are going to show some Chermoda calculations, this GDRs, all these mac macroscopic pictures, but uh, but I wanted to know that uh, to let you know that this is a subject which is not obsolete at all. Nuclear physics, although it was discovered 110 years ago, it has uh, it has been a very elusive uh, force to uh, infer, and it was Hans Bethe in 1953 already who said that more man hours have been given to this problem than to any other scientific question in the history of humankind. So the problem of the nuclear force, or, or what is the same, the nuclear nuclear interaction. So we don't have a nuclear nuclear interaction, nuclear potential per se. I was, uh, you know, Goldberger, who, who was at Princeton at that time, 1960, who brought it rough. 
really. I mean, there are a few problems in modern theoretical physics which have attracted more attention than that of trying to determine the fundamental interaction between two nucleons. It is also true that scarcely ever has the world of physics owed so little to so many. I mean, this is a very harsh comment, but you know, it's kind of uh, true at that time and, and things have developed, but still we are not fully uh, there yet. So uh, it is hard to believe that many of the authors are talking about the same problem, or in fact, that they know what the problem is. This is typically the case when you don't know, you try to, to solve problems, but uh, if the, foundation, the foundations are not there or the, or the bigger picture is not there, it's difficult to solve any, any big problem that, like the, the, the problem of the nuclear force. So what is the, the point? What is the issue with the nuclear force? Obviously, we are dealing, as uh, Marun and Greiner pointed out, we are dealing with a system of particles that where, where you cannot uh, apply quantum mechanics, the Schrodinger equation for, for a system of, because the system is actually neither small enough to allow direct solution, you know, say applying the Schrodinger equation to a system of 12, 14 particles is very difficult, nor large enough to make a statistical methods highly accurate, right? We're talking about a system of 12, 20, 100 uh, particles where, where statistical methods are not uh, accurate and which interact, as we mentioned before, through an interaction that has still not been pinned down to any definite form. So the situation remains the same as almost as in 1950s, but we'll see some of the developments, and this is what we are here for. So the main development was, uh, was obviously to, to consider the, the coupling constant you know, of the different forces. So to have a quantum description, these coupling constants, they must be small. And so you can apply perturbation and, and renormalization theory. So, however, you can see a, a coupling constant quite small for the electromagnetic force, for the weak interaction and for the gravitational force. However, a strong interaction as uh, about one uh, when confinement, you know, when quarks are confined, which uh, doesn't allow for uh, quantum treatment in terms of perturbation plus uh, renormalization techniques. So this, uh, you know, unlike in, in quantum electrodynamics, that's, that's why everyone wanted to, to go this route because quantum electrodynamics was very successful and they predicted, I mean, they confirmed uh, in one part to 10 to the eight, the lamp shift and different, uh, different uh, anomalous magnetic moment of the electron. So it was very, very successful quantum electrodynamics to uh, explain uh, physics. However, in nuclear physics, the situation was a little bit more uh, complicated. In high energy physics, the situation became clearer once you uh, consider that uh, as at very high energies, uh, there is asymptotic freedom. So basically the quarks, which are tight and they are confined at uh, alpha equal about one, so as you increase the energy and you decrease the separation between quarks, then uh, there is asymptotic freedom and you can apply because the coupling constant becomes small, then you can apply perturbation methods and uh, QCD, quantum chromodynamics is very successful, although also very tedious computationally to uh, allows us to calculate things better, easier than with Low, let's call it low energy nuclear physics. So, so let's divide high energy nuclear physics, certain kind of experiments and low energy nuclear physics, our close, uh, uh, close related physics, you know, stars and nothing where you need a super accelerator or the big bang or, you know, it's, it's just uh, something probably closer to us. So forces appear because one matter particle emits a, a force particle. This is was also part of the, for the quantum treatment. And obviously the, the electrons or the protons, they, they, they interact through a virtual photon, the weak interaction through a, a W a boson. The, the gluons are the, the, the color particle, which, in, which makes the, the, the quarks interact. 
with each other. And in the case of the, of the nucleons, protons and neutrons, it was the pion, many pions, different mesons, which contribute to the strong interaction. Many mesons, as I say, the pion is the, is the one involved in the long range interaction, but there are many, many mesons involved in this exchange. And this is again why the nuclear force is quite complicated to, to deal with. Uh, for the students, whoever is, uh, is not uh, getting this picture, this kind of Feynman diagram is basically the same as when you are on a, on a boat, you throw the ball, so you recoil, the other one recoils as well. So there's an interaction between these two boats through the exchange of a particle, right? So there are things that are a little bit more complicated than those diagrams I, I just showed. Things become a little bit more uh, difficult. Um, difficulties arise also in the sense of dealing with uh, some mathematical constraints. But uh, let's move on. I will come to the picture later. So what we do here is uh, we saw, we try to solve a Hamiltonian where you have the kinetic energy, the nucleon nucleon potential, and also other like three nucleon potentials, you know, which also play a role in, uh, in the interaction between uh, nucleons within a nucleus, right? So what uh, people thought of, okay, let's have a, a new degrees of freedom. Let's move from quarks and gluons to uh, pions and nucleons. And uh, we'll see that approach later, how you cut in, in some of the physics that you don't know or you cannot, uh, you cannot uh, uh, deal with mathematically. And you just cut that physics, which you don't know, and trying to solve problems and see what happens, right? So this is the approach that we have taken. As I, I mentioned here, this is a repulsive core. As you get uh, to smaller distances, this is the rearm of the of quarks, um, high energy physics. And here you have the typical nucleon nucleon potential, which we call it as a function of distance, uh, where you have the typical Zhukawa one pion exchange potential here. And then we have two pion exchange. Uh, you have the negative potential, obviously it's attractive. The positive potential is, is repulsive. Um, as I say, uh, we need to uh, apply these renormalization techniques, but here, this, this goes to infinity and cutting this bit is like, is a, is a reflection of our ignorance and lack really of fundamental uh, concept, conceptual foundations. So divergent integrals and infinities uh, are absorbed into the, into the infinite rescaling of the coupling constant and masses of the theory. So these, uh, these different constants are helping us to, to apply, uh, I will shall see in a little bit, quantum mechanics when it's really not uh, uh, possible. So here we have the first order perturbation theory where the, there's a change in the energy. Uh, and typical, what I wanted to say here, that if you have a, a, a infinite potential, uh, a wave function, which is uh, finite, so the, 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 prog the product of the two is also infinite. So uh, high order co higher order corrections um, in, in perturbation theory are also infinite, right? So this is because, again, because of the repulsive potential. So uh, solution. As I say, we need to renormalize the repulsive part of the, of the nucleon nucleon potential, which comes with huge matrix elements. And there are two ways which have been uh, done lately, either with the G matrix, uh, which we'll see has a, a, a no end point, uh, with, the, with the no quotient model, which can be done where you don't have a, a, a core. However, that's uh, untractable for uh, heavy nuclei. It's only tractable for very few, uh, very, very light nuclei. So carbon 12, oxygen 16, unless you use different, uh, uh, different tricks. So which um, also the nucleon nucleon potential is not unique. You know, we have a, a, a wide variety of possibilities. It's not like the Coulomb force or the gravitation for, uh, gravitational force where everything is clear. Here we have, uh, if we want to get a, a, a a nuclear nucleon potential, what we do is we uh, scatter, elastic scattering of protons and uh, proton with neutrons and deuterons. And then we see how, how these things uh, work. But you can see these different potential, the Paris, the Bong A, that was the first generation, the Nikin Mayen one and two, the Argon V18, the CD bomb, 
or the chiral ones that came uh, a little bit later. All have the same long range interaction and they all differ in the short range repulsion and intermediate range attraction. So basically uh, you fit all the parameters. You have lots of parameters to reproduce the elastic uh, uh, nucleon nucleon scattering data and deuteron properties. What do you actually do is basically, uh, let me say a little bit more on that. Uh, these are called realistic potentials because they, they, are, uh, they work quite well and they are uh, phenomenological meson exchange models. And they have in common that, as I say, they are charge independent. I use 40 to 50 parameters and uh, they have very high precision. That's why they are realistic. So, as I say again, they differ in the treatment of the short, short range uh, repulsion. Okay, so that's what we have. Uh, a little bit on the on how these things are uh, determined. Uh, here we go. So this is the the typical uh, phase shift of a uh, of a. Uh, Proton proton or a, or a neutron proton, the partial wave is determined by the uh, total angular momentum. 2s is s is the spin, spin angular momentum, and j is the total angular momentum. So this 1s0 is for a, a proton proton uh, or a neutron proton pointing with the spins up and down. We we'll just scatter them together. And you know, the the this is how you uh, I will show a little bit of, of the formalism, but basically the partial wave it determines the when you have the interaction at the beginning you have a free wave at the end once you have the interaction the elastic uh, scattering there is a, the, the particles have gone through through the nuclear force the nuclear potential right and there's a phase shift with respect to the uh, the the free the free wave right the free particle wave. So this is basically what is uh, what you measure. You measure cross sections, and the cross section basically uh, determine the the phase shift. And through those, you fit to the to the experimental data. And you know by 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 using the different the different partial waves uh, in a scattering theory, you determine your nuclear potential. As I say, there are many of those because each one uh, fit the, the data in different ways, right? So in addition, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning here, uh, when I started uh, with the potentials, we have also a three nucleon, three nucleon potential, which also plays a role, but it's not so easy to determine that one because that one actually cannot be extracted from experimental data. Uh, the, 3A interaction is not unique and depends on the 2M potential that you are using. So you're using the, the CD bone or the argon V18, you will have a different three nucleon potential. So it's not unique and cannot be determined uh, from experimental data. So that's a, a little bit of an issue. But here you can see that the, by applying three nucleon forces, the uh, binding energy of the alpha particle and the binding energy of the triton is well reproduced. Whereas if you use any of the two nucleon forces, any of the two nucleon potentials here, the CD bone, the Nick Mayen, or the argon, v, argon uh, V18, you don't reproduce the experimental data, which is here, right? So it's important uh, to understand the, the nuclear force. And in particular, here we have another picture where we can see the effect of three nucleon forces on excitation energy. So if we apply, if we apply those uh, uh, realistic potentials, actually you get quite a high precision on the on the calculations of binding energies uh, for nuclei as large as uh, A equal 12. But there are certain cases where the three nucleon forces play a role. So for instance, in the case of beryllium 10, where well, you see this is the, the argon V18, two nucleon force, this bluish, this cyan color. And this is the uh, argon V18 plus the Illinois 2, which is a three nucleon force, three nucleon potential. As you can see, the first one, the first two excitation, the first two plus actually, first two plus is the first excitation in this nucleus, beryllium 10. This guy goes up and this guy comes down. So there's an inversion of states if you use. Uh, 
only two nucleon, two nucleon force or two nucleon plus three nucleon forces here, right? So basically the three nucleon force brings more binding to the uh, nuclear system. And obviously we have to check if this is correct. I mean, this inversion of states are very important. Uh, we need to understand them experimentally if this is the case. So, uh, as I say, uh, there was also an additional, uh, an additional issue. It was that these uh, states, once you apply the three, uh, three nucleon forces or the three nucleon potential, the shapes of the nucleus will, the, of the two plus in particular, will change. You will have a negative a spectroscopic quadruple moment if you apply uh, two nucleon plus three nucleon forces, and the other, otherwise, if you only consider two nucleon forces. So it was important to determine what was the shape of that nucleus, not only for that, but also to try to understand clustering in nuclei, because beryllium 10 is uh, supposed to be two alpha particles and two uh, neutrons. But uh, also to understand the, 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 the idea of a spin orbit interaction, because, uh, you know, each, each interaction is different, and the spin orbit interaction is related to the, to the short range of the nuclear force. Uh, we wanted to explore also on the, on the spin orbit interaction. So here, uh, we, have, uh, we have what we determined. Actually, it was one of the first experiments where we could determine the shape, the, the crossing between this curve determined by Coulomb excitation and the lifetime measurement from before, determining a negative, a negative quadruple moment, a spectroscopic quadruple moment, which was, which leads to a, a prolate shape like a rugby ball, uh, assuming the, the, the rotational model. And uh, this confirmed the sequence of states predicted by two nucleon forces plus three nucleon forces. So basically, our experiment was done at Triumph in Vancouver. And this led to this nice publication here in 2012, where it was, as I say, one of the, of the higher statistics for the population of a high line to plus states, where, where we uh, included the nuclear polarizability for the first time. This was the first time I was introduced to the nuclear polarizability which was uh, the topic of the, of the talk, but I thought that this is more important for us to understand the history behind uh, this, uh, this nuclear polarizability and other effects that we're going to see uh, next. So another very important point of this paper was the deeper, because we also did some of initial calculations ourselves with the no coarser model and the CD bone potential, only two nucleon forces. And we agreed with a negative quadruple moment that was predicted by the argon V18 plus three nucleon forces, right? So two nucleon forces plus three nucleon forces gave you the negative quadruple moment that was uh, calculated also by the CD bond potential with only two nucleon forces. So it was clear that the argon V18 and the CD bond potential di didn't, didn't have the same uh, spin orbit interaction. So the three nucleon forces at that time didn't need to be uh, used uh, because uh, we could predict uh, a negative quadruple moment without involving in any three nucleon forces, right? No three nucleon forces could do the same job. So still, the discussion is there. Uh, that's the same slide, I think. So I'm gonna leap in this one. Okay, so then there were some issues if you move to momentum space. So if uh, you go to momentum space, then the different potentials are not the same anymore, right? Here we have a different partial wave, neutron, proton, proton, neutron, I mean, proton, proton with uh, the same uh, spins up and spin down. And the, here we have the, the, the neutron proton interaction, elastic scattering of uh, with the neutron and, pro and proton pointing up, one half spin pointing up. And this is the, uh, as you can see, there are, uh, there are different here. Uh, obviously, this was clear. And now we're going to take a detour, a little bit of a detour to move towards an effective field uh, trip. So at that time, when we were running all these experiments and doing these calculations, we didn't have a, a clear understanding of, uh, of uh, the nuclear nucleon potential 
uh, no, no, no one did really. So there was a, a huge uh, excitement when, when effective field theory was applied to nuclear physics. And this came at the beginning, there was no issue. I mean, there was, a, there was no way to calculate uh, transition probability. So many things happen that are happening, in, are happening in nuclei. So complex properties of nuclei were difficult to, to calculate, but simple things like excitation energies, it was, uh, it was possible. So this effective field theory approach was, you know, this is a typical picture it's shown many, in many places about resolution as you go to higher energy. Obviously you can look down, you can zoom in on what is the, the nucleus composed of, and you know, up and down, you go to lower energies, you have the, the proton and the neutrons and the pion interaction. And then you have uh, the proton, you know, you go lower in energy, you have the, the different proton and neutrons oscillating against each other, the vibrational state in T in here and then collective picture, everything becomes more fuzzy, but doesn't mean that becomes less, uh, less physics, you know, less physical, you know, sometimes uh, the microscopic world is too complicated. Uh, we are only given the chance to have a macroscopic picture of this uh, microcosmos, right? And, um, you know, like happens in thermodynamics, you take the temperature as a, as a, as a, as a, macroscopic uh, uh, variable of what is happening inside a, a gas or whatever, right? So, um, so here we use the, the, the fact that low energy observables are insensitive to the details of the, of the short, uh, short uh, sorry, distance dynamics. And the effective field theory approach exploits this insensitivity by ex explicitly uh, keeping only the pion and nucleon degrees of freedom. So, which is called the spontaneous chiral symmetry breaking QCD. And the effective field theory that provides a model independent description of the two nucleon system. So this is the tool. So here we have again, why, uh, you know, the, the, the just a, another example of how, why the, the, the energy, I mean, the symmetry is broken. So, and uh, there's a nice review paper, which explains uh, things very nicely. So at low energies, nuclear physics, what we call nuclear physics, we have a strong QCD. Basically, the coupling, con the coupling constant is large. And we cannot apply a perturbative method. So it's a totally different world to the real QCD at high energies, right? So here we have asymptotic freedom. So this is basically a summary of what we have been discussing so far. So can chiral effective field theory give us a satisfaction? This is Rupa Maclade from Idaho. Um, he is uh, saying, obviously, he, he com compared the different potentials, and he came with the with the picture that actually uh, that we have uh, defective field theory uh, provides a better picture than any other uh, realistic potential. First thing, you know, you have uh, twenty eight parameters only, so you have less number of parameters, but. Uh, as you say here, is EFT is superior to all earlier approaches in terms of both formal aspects and successful application in our initial calculations. So as you say, we still have the issue of the renormalization. And we come to that in a, a little bit. So here we have the, the different, uh, different uh, next to next to next to next leading orders. And you can see all, also, the advantage of the, of the chiral effective field theory is that first is rooted in low energy QCD. And then it comes with the hierarchy of the nuclear forces, right? The nuclear forces are dominant because they are leading order, next to leading order, and only next to next leading order, just having three nuclear forces, uh, next to next to next leading order, just have, uh, you have more uh, uh, power counting, more uh, uh, different. Uh, uh, Feynman diagrams uh, describing the that perturbation that we are mentioning here before, and generates two and many body forces of an equal footing. This is very important to to outline because, as I said at the beginning, the three nucleon force depends on the on the two nucleon force, and no one really knows how to uh, add it to the different two nucleon potentials that we had before. Here it rises the three nucleon forces arise uh, uh, naturally 
and this was an, again a big success of effective field theory over the previous uh, realistic uh, potentials. And here you can see again how it reproduces nicely as you go from the, this, the dots are the experimental point as you go to from leading order to next to next to next to four times next uh, leading order the situation uh, improves uh, as you can see here next to next to next leading order m3 low is already quite good uh, but here you can see that m4 low does a better job uh, so convergency is very important as we can as we see and this is a new uh, a recent paper uh, written by by the leading authors in the in the field so what you have uh, actually i want to outline a little bit to know to note for you to know that this was submitted in march 2018 and it was only published in june 2020 you know more than two two years later they published in reviews of modern physics so it's a it's a tough one that one every every job is a tough one so now uh, these are some of the of the successes of the of the effective field theory. Well, in this case, they have been using a, a lattice um, to uh, they have applied basically uh, same uh, techniques as they use in, in high energy physics, particle physics. And we have the we are lucky to have uh, Dean Lee, who was a, a particle physicist before, and he gave a, a very beautiful talk at the at the taste of nuclear physics. But basically, we are uh, applying first ab initio calculation, the first ab initio calculation of the carbon 12 of the Hoyle state. Remember that this is a, a, a very a special state, how life is created in everywhere. It's supposed to happen because the beryllium 8 capture an alpha particle and the energy release matches that energy of a level which happens to exist at 7.654 MeV, which is called the Hoyle state. Without that level there, we wouldn't be alive, right? So this was a very important breaking, uh, breaking news and uh, a success of uh, effective field theory. So this is one of the first uh, uh, players or the main players in effective field theory, Rup uh, Maclade. And as he says, the never ending story he's asking coming to an end. It may be too early to claim that the never ending story is coming to an end, but the story seems to be conver converging at the same rate as chiral perturbation theory. So let's see what happened. Now they have, I think, M5 low. So let's see how. Uh, so another thing I wanted to say is that for these kind of calculations, we have with these have initial calculations, you need supercomputers. It's not like so now we are not in the at the back of the envelope anymore, and you need like uh, 54 trillion mathematical calculations per second. You need over 200,000 uh, processors to run these kind of calculations, and there are different approaches that I mentioned here. Uh, but you know, it's it's. Uh, it's not easy. So once we have come to this point, it still remains very difficult to do ab initio calculations of light nuclei. There are new approaches that are coming uh, in, into the market, but they are, you know, uh, again, playing different tricks. You know, proper from first principle calculations, uh, you need huge, huge computing power. And uh, I know that uh, Francesco won't like this one, but I love computers. But we cannot rely on computers too much, right? You, we are maybe wait, uh, waiting for com quantum computers to come, which will increase our new breakthrough. We can reach from oxygen 16 to neon 20 and, and do more uh, accurate calculations or whatever we had done before. But computers cannot be the, the leading order in our discovery, right? It cannot be just be more computational power or you know, machine learning or whatever is the, is, the, is the solution to these problems. It has to be physics um, used you know, with the help of computers, but we must be uh, always aware that we, we must do our job as well as, uh, as physicists. Uh, this is something I always, I always mention in all the talks. Uh, I did this for the, for the COVID-19, but this I think is a, is a very funny uh, 
uh, article who, which was written by Freeman Dyson. I went to, to see Fermi one day with one of these potentials, right? And he came to him very, very happy. You know, I, I'm, I'm Enrico Fermi asking, how many arbitrary parameters did you, did you use for your calculations? I thought for a moment and, 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 and he said, well, I thought about his cutoff procedures. You know, he's already cutting off doing this renormalization. And then he asked four. He said, uh, you know, Enrico Fermi, I remember my friend Johnny von Neumann used to say with four parameters, I can feed an elephant and with five, I can make him wiggle his trunk. With that, um, Freeman Dyson understood that the conversation was over. <laughs> Uh, he escaped to Berkeley, California to start a new career. So he, he quit nuclear physics on time. So now out of these realistic potentials, obviously you need to make a, something work because these realistic potential, you need to, 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 to use it as an effective interaction in your shell model uh, uh, calculations. You know, the shell model is the same as we have for for novel gases, you know, nuclei are more stable for with these particular magic numbers, 2, 8, 20, where there are these, you have these gaps here, which makes nuclei uh, more stable. And this happens also because we stole from atomic physics, we stole the idea of spin orbit interaction. And we assume there was a, an average potential produced for all, with, with all, the, all the nucleons within the nucleus, right? Obviously this was, uh, a terrible thing to, to, to think because there was no microscopic foundation and there were people like, like Fermi himself who, who didn't like this idea or the shell model or the nuclear shell model. And uh, because, you know, one thing is clear, this, the, this is a short range of the nuclear force, the saturation, this is the binding energy per nucleon as you have seen this, this is the, the typical uh, semi-classical uh, mass, uh, this, uh, the, the mass uh, semi empirical uh, approximation for the, for the binding energy, the Vete by Sake uh, semi empirical mass formula. Uh, as you can see, I always ask my students to determine what is the range of the nuclear force from this plot. And I won't come to the, to the conclusion because I, I'm going to ask that question tomorrow or the day after. But this is already, already telling you that. The, the, the strong force is very short range and only affects those neighboring nuclei. And, uh, and, the, and the fact that suddenly you come with an average potential, you know, where you, you have all nucleons being involved, it sounded at that time uh, unrealistic, right? It's not like the, the atom. The atom, you have a, a clear, uh, Coulomb force, we have the, the nucleus in the middle, and you have the electrons around, you know, so it's, it's a clear central force. Here is not a, a proper central force, as we know. But the breakthrough came from uh, the G matrix um, and Bruckner, you know, the, the, the fact that any mm, realistic potential, this nucleon nucleon potential, uh, from there, we can calculate the properties of complex nuclei came from uh, Bruckner and the G matrix and who and Brown were the first ones to apply this idea. So the theory of Bruckner and co-workers permits in principle, the calculation of properties of complex nuclei. So Bruckner had tamed extremely short uh, range interaction between two nucleons, often uh, taken to be infinite, infinite in repulsion and at short range at the time. So uh, this was done in a, in a, in a very uh, intelligent and smart way, because uh, first thing we need the model space, uh, a model, we need a model space uh, Hamiltonian, an effective model space Hamiltonian, which can reproduce certain physical properties of the original Hamiltonian. And Bruckner realized that the short, the strong short range interaction will scatter to nucleons to momenta well above, well above those fields in the Fermi C. And this will be only prevented by the Pauli, uh, Pauli blocking effect. So this, this was key because this allow two particles, what is called uh, pairing correlations to scatter throughout and not only, only with, the, with those close by neighbors, right? 
So the, the, the paradox that we saw before was fixed also by Bruckner because uh, this allow for that average potential to happen, right? Before it wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't clear, there was no theoretical foundation, right? So you have a short range and an average potential that didn't, didn't work with each other until Bruckner came and, uh, and, uh, and came with the G matrix approach. So which allows for more power counting and uh, uh, allowed for, for doing the same thing, the same uh, perturbative methods that we have uh, seen before. So this was the microscopic foundation of the shell model. So there's a nice paper here from Kuo Brown to today's realistic shell model calculations by Coraggio and collaborators. So uh, obviously there were some issues also with the G matrix, but it was a beautiful trick and uh, explain the, 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 the essence of the, of the nuclear shell model. So the construction of the G matrix is energy dependent. And obviously there's an uncontrolled dependence on the starting point, the starting energy. Whereas uh, no core calculations, there's no energy dependence, right? So we have these two methods, uh, the no core shell model and the, and the G matrix, where you have an effective interaction, but it comes at a price, right? It comes at a price because you don't have as many uh, correlations as you have with the, with the no core uh, calculations. And for all the perturbation is the maximum we can reach. To go farther, we need a couple cluster approximation, which is, up, is used heavily in, in, in quantum chemistry, in chemistry and in, in, in solid state, and also lately in the last years in nuclear physics. So what do we do then? So we, we opted for, uh, for using, uh, for checking, uh, Actually, in this case, uh, Tom Ku and his team, they opted uh, Brack McLean, David Entem in, in, in Salamanca, he's in Spain. So they, they did use what was called the V-locate, the low momentum nuclear nuclear interaction. So this low momentum nuclear nuclear interaction arises. Remember, I mentioned before that, uh, that the, the, if you go to high momentum, the situation was difficult to accommodate different potentials, they predict different partial waves. So what uh, Tom Kuo and, and Bogner and his team realized was that uh, we can actually uh, cut to a cutoff uh, in, in momentum space and, and see whether this uh, makes sense. So they, 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 they made the assumption that don't, no need to the high energy details of the, of the short range correlations of the nuclear force to understand low energy uh, nuclear physics. But uh, we can have an effective uh, theory if we make a cutoff, which corresponds you know, this 2.5, 2.1 Fermi to the minus one, which corresponds to laboratory energies, a cutoff at the pion production, basically. Uh, what is the same? We integrate out momenta above, uh, above uh, this lambda of 2.1 and renormalize the information needed for low energy physics into the effective theory. This is called the T matrix, which is the similar to the G matrix. Um, we preserve the physics below the cutoff, phase shift and binding energy of the deuterium. So let's see whether this approach, uh, these assumptions make sense. And you can see here a beautiful plot. This was uh, uh, something amazing, right? Because you go from, from high energy 4.5, now we are in momentum space, Fermi to the minus one, 3.1, 3.1, uh, Fermi to the minus one. And you can see how all the different potentials, they collapse to what was called the, the V low K, you know, the potential with the low uh, momentum space, right? So for 2.1, all the different realistic potentials converge beautifully at that uh, particular cutoff, right? So this is for the, for the S31 uh, partial wave, but also we have it for the different partial waves. You know, as you, as you increase, there were some issues uh, somewhere, but uh, as you go to, to 2.1, you see that most of the potentials converge with each other. 
and this is what is what's called the collapse of the of the realistic nucleon nucleon potential partial waves to the uh, to the v log a. So the evolution of the diagonal momentum space matrix elements for the v log a derived for the from the different bare potentials at the cutoff of uh, of two point one Fermi to the minus one. This is for the S31, S31, but not only for that, but also for the different partial waves. As you can see, the, the 3P naught and the, the P11, the P32, all the partial waves uh, converge at the end. There was a huge uh, breakthrough. And the first thing was to calculate something to, to, to make it uh, uh, workable to, to see whether we can, put, we can reproduce any 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 observables, right? So we uh, they tried for oxygen eighteen, uh, tellurium one thirty four, iodine one thirty five, and they could reproduce quite well some of the excitation energies. But then the question was to, in two thousand and two how whether this was suitable for uh, more than two valence nucleons, whether we can apply this VLOK for more complicated uh, things, right? So uh, here came another breakthrough. And the breakthrough uh, was about calculating complex properties of nuclei, uh, in particular uh, matrix elements, E2 and M1, magnetic and electric matrix elements, with the shell model by using an effective uh, interaction. At this time, the effective interaction was, uh, was being uh, built by Jason Holt at Stony Brook. And I spent uh, a month or so at Stony Brook with Jason and Tom Kuo. And there I was already uh, versatile trying to, to run these uh, shell model calculations. So we, uh, we didn't just uh, calculate energies, but let's say let's, let's calculate quadruple moments, uh, transition probabilities, M1, E1. And the, this was part of Jason Holt uh, PhD thesis, who was uh, also Jerry Brown's uh, student. And so uh, here is uh, what we actually did. So you have the, the, uh, the, the dipole magnetic operator in one. This you have a, a little hat for all the operators. And you have an isoscalar comp uh, component, which is not isospin dependent. And you have an isovector component, which is isospin dependent. And you have a strong M1 transitions whenever you have a, a Isovector transition because in this case the g uh, the spin g factor for protons and the spin g, uh, g factor for neutrons minus minus is plus so this adds up so you have a larger n one transition n one decay if you have an isovector transition right so in this case this is a isovector part which has no isospin dependence tau is the isospin. So as you can see, you may get more M1 strength if you add the spin G factors, right? Because five minus minus three, right? Or four. This number here was actually the beginning of quarks. This, uh, the spin G factor was the first indication that the, the neutrons had something inside, which was called quark. Um, remains one of the, of the solid, uh, the most solid evidence for for quarks. So, uh, as I say, the isoscalar term is much weaker than isovector due to the strong cancellation of the spin G factors. Here we have the plus. So basically, you have the 5.5 minus 3.8. So this, these two are the same, the angular momentum G factors. And obviously, uh, this, uh, this was the case. Uh, it's not the GDR because GDR is electric. And this one uh, is a magnetic, as I want, I want to show you. This actually doesn't belong here. This belongs here. So we, uh, we uh, measure this large M1 strength uh, in a nucleus for the first time in an odd even nucleus. It was the first time of, uh, that this kind of uh, collective mode was discovered in, a, in an odd mass nucleus, in this case, the Niobe 93. I was published in Physical Review Letters. It was the, the fermionic bosonic couplings in, the, in a nearly spherical uh, nucleus. And this was the heaviest uh, nucleus at that time, or where 
uh, electromagnetic transitions were calculated using effective field theory, using the, the VLOK. And this was the collective motion of neutron and protons oscillating against each other, but uh, which led to very large M1 uh, transitions between those, uh, those states. So this was the, uh, the nice discovery of a new collective mode of uh, vibration, isovector vibration. So this uh, actually was uh, after, you know, Goldberger and his Rafa uh, comments. It was uh, quite beautiful that we could actually reproduce these uh, matrix elements. Um, um, we compare, obviously, we compare with the, the VLOK and we, we determine similar uh, M1 strength to the ones we, we, we determine experimentally. And here you have Jason Hall, this is the second author on this paper. So basically, we, we work together in making this happen. This was his PhD thesis. Jason Hall is checking out the other day because uh, one student of ours is going to join him to do a, a we're going to, he's going to do a joint PhD with, the, with, the, with him and me. And I, I realized that he has three physical review letters only this year. So, so it's becoming very productive and very, very, very impressive. This is what we have to compare to, not to anyone else. Jason Holt, three PRLs in 2021. So as I say that uh, this insecure and contradictory, this book, I love this book by Albert Einstein. It's a, it's a very short book, but has the, all the essence for you to say, okay, this is what we have to do. So that this insecure and contradictory foundation he was talking about Bohr and the and the and the, the hydrogen atom. Enabled Bohr to discover the principal laws of the spectral lines and of the electron shells of the atoms appears to me as a miracle, and appears to me a, a miracle even today. So this is what uh, what we uh, we discovered. Also, it was kind of a miracle because it was difficult to to get some properties uh, complex or in complex nuclei. It was easier to do, not, not easy. I mean, you need huge computer, computing power, but you can do beryllium 10, you can go do carbon 12, the whole state. But to do this, now you have 93, you have 93, part, 93 particles, and it's quite complicated to, to reach to some kind of conclusion. Still, we have to be purist. And then we remember uh, Paul Dirac, and he thought about these renormalization techniques, that they were clever tricks rather than a principal solution to a fundamental problem, right? We are playing, uh, we are really playing uh, clever tricks by cutting off some of the physics because we think it's not important for low energy. And Dirac hoped for a revolutionary change in basic principles that will eventually bring the theory of, uh, to a degree of logical consistency. Theories that require no renormalization whatsoever. So this is, uh, the end of this story for today. I thought it was going to be, as I say, it's already one hour. I want to thank many people, you know, many people, uh, but I just uh, didn't have the time to think enough about so many people have to acknowledge so many discussions, so many, uh, you know. I thank you, everyone. And I just finished today. I finished on time. Look at this, seven, five o'clock. <laughs> Yeah, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Nico, for a great uh, overview of, of, of nuclear physics uh, with uh, your interesting work uh, embedded. <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, I think we have uh, uh, one question in the, in the Q&A so far, and, uh, and I'm very tempted to ask uh, the person that asked the question, Professor Bucha, and give me the permission to talk. So Martin, you should be able to ask your question uh, directly to, to Nico. Uh, hi, Nico. Um, hi, Martin. Thanks. <laughs> we, were we supposed to meet last Friday or what? Oh, <laughs> <I was> for... <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about that later. Um, <laughs> thanks for a really nice um, talk. Um, uh, this question is perhaps more um, mathematical physics than nuclear physics. Um, but when you were talking about um, partial waves and the scattering cross-section, I was wondering if, if, I, um, 
if I can measure the partial waves for a certain channel at all um, energies and um, if you don't have any, you know, um, three or more body interactions, is there a sort of unique mapping between the phase shifts and the potential? Or can you give get, uh, find two potentials that have exactly the same phase shifts and are not distinguishable from each other. Yeah, yeah, you can find all of them. You know, you have 40 to 50 parameters. Any potential can reproduce the phase shift, not in momentum space. Here we go. I'm going to show you here. Uh, you know, with, 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 with four parameters, you can fit an elephant. With five, you can fit the, you can, he can, the, the, the elephant can wiggle his trunk, right? So with these 40 to 50 parameters, you see all the different potentials in energy. And this is the phase shift. They reproduce the, the, the phase shift quite well, you know. Sure. And this is a general, general statement for any partial wave. Um, I was more asking sort of in a spirit of, you know, infinite parameters to infinite parameters. Can you find two potentials that give you exactly the, the same um, phase shifts at all energies, you know, with, um, with no differences. <laughs> so in, in energy, you mean in, in, in energy, energy in the lab frame, you mean here, like in, or, or in, 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 in linear moment, in momentum space or in energy space? In, in energy. In, space yeah for a particular yeah, channel <laughs> yeah I, yeah i think so i mean this is uh, what we are saying that you need the the agreement of all these potentials are k square per dayton equal to one almost right so all these fits but you you require but you require 40 to 50 parameters independently and uh, there's no potential all these potentials are phenomenological right there's no and if mathematically, mathematically to, to hide the infinities, you need all these all these potentials, right? So there's no there's no way out to come. I don't know with a solution, which uh, I mean, so far hasn't been done. That's why it's the it's the most difficult problem in, in the history, you know. But I think in terms of phase shift, all these different I don't know if I, I understand well, uh, Martin. All these different potentials, they reproduce the phase shift. And as you see, they are quite the same. But when we move to momentum and space, the, the situation is different. OK, thank you. Sorry, sorry Martin, we can discuss. I don't, I don't think I, I, I got it right. I, mean, I don't understand the question, actually, because uh, and, and there's no. Martin, uh, that there are no other people that are raising their hand at the moment. So Martin, if you want to follow up on your question, yeah, please. We, we still have follow a up few because we're not. Uh, I, I don't know if I, I don't think I answered your question properly. No, Martin, you are still. Um, I guess when I look at this data, it 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 looks like a here like a very simple power law. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> Yeah, it does. Yeah, that's right. We we have been doing this modeling, COVID nineteen modeling, for too long now, and then we can we can predict anything, you know. But these guys, <laughs> but these guys have been working on this for 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 hundred and ten years. You know, this is scattering data up to three fifty MeV, and you have the data points are here, and, and you can see the different. Uh, <laughs> Actually, actually, these are the uh, yeah, these are the, the the different potentials, but also the, compared with this argon, MP, PP. But you know, if if we check phase shift, I think we have what oh sorry, what the uh, what is nice the, nice to see. I mean, there are many of these plots where all the phase shift come together independently of the of the potential. As you can see, they are very they are called realistic potentials for a reason. They are very very high precision, right? But what I really find uh, interesting here is the fact that, you know, this is what happened, you know, in, in, in momentum space, right? You don't see the, 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 the nice agreement anymore, but once you cut it, 
cut off, uh, you do your cut off, obviously. Uh, I'm going the wrong way, no? Uh, yeah, I'm going the right way. So when you do the cut off, you can see that as you go to lower energies or to higher momentum, I mean, to lower momentum, uh, then all the potentials combine. But I don't think, I don't think this is the case for uh, once you consider the, the repulsive core. The repulsive core is a is a is a is an issue and remains an issue to this day. Well, I guess in simple terms, the wave function would just uh, um, decay really quickly into the core and not not see it if if that picture were valid. Uh, sorry, Martin, this one here. Oh, I was just thinking in terms of uh, um, a, a potential of R and the wave function. The wave function would uh, would decay oh, yeah. very fast and only see the the edge of the repulsive core, or it wouldn't be able to. Well, we, uh, we mentioned here, no? Yeah. Okay. So. Right, so, but it, it, when you apply perturbation, you see that this is going to be uh, an infinite anyway, right? So- but The Bornock approximation is crazy when you have a really hard core. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> so that's why you, you need to get rid of the core, otherwise you, you, you cannot apply. So I think, I think uh, the problem is, okay, we, we use quantum uh, electrodynamics. I was, everything was beautiful and, and I will, everyone like it, and we got Richard Feynman and all these people, you know, winning Nobel prizes, and then everyone moved towards that way of doing physics, which was probably right at that time. But we have found that there's a there's a there's no way out. You know, this this is this, there is no way out to solve the problem of the nuclear force by using the same the same uh, procedure, the same perturbation theory plus normalization techniques. That were applied to uh, quantum electrodynamics, right? So I think I think this is the. So we are trying. Obviously, QCD works okay, but even QCD, you know, QCD also has the the, the issues, and you know better than me. Uh, if we go, I uh, have a few slides here on QCD. You know, however, you know the quarks and gluons in the nucleus are not the really asymptotically free, you know, and they, instead they comprise individual colorless, you know, this is the, 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 we call it asymptotic freedom, but it's not really the case. And then there are fundamental questions which remain an answer. Um, you see the proton and neutron masses haven't, haven't been calculated yet. Um, for the deuteron, you know, you need a huge lattice calculation. When I, I wrote this slide uh, a few years ago, the, even the deuteron wasn't calculated from first principles, you know, using uh, lattice QCD. So there are issues everywhere. And I think, uh, to, to, in my opinion, I think Feynman was too strong of a, of a character. And that was the, the way to go for many people. Uh, of, Feynman was actually too good, too good for the, for the rest of us. Uh, not only Feynman, but the you know, quantum electrodynamics at the end of the day was very successful, right? As we, we mentioned uh, at the beginning. But I don't know, we, we, need, to, we need to think. I think we need to think uh, about uh, a way, you know, this uh, confinement, this strong coupling cost, constant here is, uh, is an issue. And uh, maybe we have to move, I don't know, do something else. Oh, well, you yeah, know, that's perfect, Nico, because <clears throat> it would be something that uh, Nitex might uh, attack. <laughs> that's right. I mean, yeah, so it was, it was, I think, it was Peter Ring actually who said, look, sticking too much to first principles prevents sometimes progress. You know, you're sticking too much to say, okay, let's do a initial, let's go from first principles. In the first place, you don't know the potential. So you cannot go first principles, even if you want in nuclear physics. So the concept of relevant scales prevented relativistic calculations for nearly 30 years. 
the concept of phase shift equivalent forces preventing hard to calculations, more uh, macroscopic calculations in nuclei for nearly, actually for atomic physics, very important, hard to for nearly 20 years. So as Peter Ring uh, wrote here in 2004, sticking too much to first principles prevents sometimes progress. So we have to be more open-minded. And as Francesco said, that's why we have Nifex here with us. Maybe we can do something spectacular, you know? <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Okay, Nico, I'm, I'm slowly <laughs> starting to worry uh, about the time. Um, so I, I think it's my pleasant duty now to, to, to thank you again for the, for the very interesting talk and also for, for showing us that uh, still also in disciplines that have been around for a long time, there are still very, very substantial problems then, um, and there will be lots of work <laughs> to be done to, to, to address them and, and, and find uh, hopefully one day uh, a solution. Yeah? So um, thank you also to all the, the participants. Um, I think probably latest tomorrow you will receive the announcement of next week's uh, talk. And uh, we are looking forward to see you again next week. And uh, maybe for the younger generation, a reminder uh, that tomorrow we will have again the second lecture <clears throat> in the mini school uh, on the introduction to the Python programming language. So I might see some of you again tomorrow. So have a good evening. And Nico, thank you very much. And Ilya, thank you very much for, 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 for the support as well. Yeah? As as well, we, always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Nico. We, we stay in touch. Yeah, all, all the best. All the best. Thank you very much.